Hello, my name is Dr. Shane Owens, and I am chair of the New York State Psychological Association's Suicide Prevention Task Force. In addition, I am a psychologist in private practice and an administrator in a college counseling center. In both of these settings, I deal routinely with suicidal crises. In the next several minutes, I will be acquainting you with or reiterating to you some basic evidence-based procedures for evaluating your patients or clients for suicide risk. I will also make some recommendations for courses of action based on the outcome of those assessments. Finally, I will be providing you with some resources from which you may obtain more information on suicidal thoughts and behaviors. According to the CDC, suicide was the 10th leading cause of death in the United States in 2010, accounting for more than 38,000 deaths. It was the second leading cause of death for those from 25 to 34, the third leading cause of death for those from 10 to 24, and the fourth leading cause of death for those between 35 and 54. As a practicing psychologist or other mental health professional, regardless of the setting in which you practice, you will come into contact with at least one suicidal individual, and likely more than one. According to one survey, 97% of psychologists in training report having contact with at least one suicidal patient. Another survey found that 87% of social workers counsel the suicidal client within the last year. Despite the fact that completed suicide is a low base rate event, 22 to 30 percent of psychologists and similar numbers of social workers report losing a patient to suicide. Among psychiatrists, that rate increases to 50 percent. Questions about suicide are an important part of each clinical interview. While I will cover differences in rates based on sex, age, racial or ethnic background, and other factors in just a few minutes, it is important to understand that no one is immune from having suicidal thoughts or engaging in suicidal behaviors. You must ask about suicide in the early stages of any clinical interview and check on suicidal thoughts and behaviors throughout the course of treatment. Let us begin by considering the warning signs of suicide. One easy way for you to remember the warning signs is the following mnemonic from the American Association of Suicidology, Is Path Warm, in which I represents suicidal ideation and S represents substance abuse. P stands for purposelessness, A stands for anxiety, T stands for trapped, and H for hopelessness. W stands for withdrawal, A for anger, R for recklessness, and M for mood changes. This mnemonic is a good way to remember the most important risk factors, but let's take a closer look at these and other signs of suicidal crises. Identifying risk factors is easily accomplished through careful assessment. Let us consider the most important questions for you to answer when you are faced with a patient who is experiencing suicidal thoughts. The most basic assessment of suicidal behavior can be easily remembered through the use of the mnemonic SLAP, where S represents suicidal ideation, L is lethality, A is access, and P is for plan. In order to be able to make an informed decision regarding your next steps with any patient who presents with suicidal ideation, you should be able to answer the following questions at the conclusion of your brief assessment. Is the patient currently thinking about hurting him or herself? What is the nature of those thoughts? Are these thoughts about actively making an attempt on his or her life, or are they just passive thoughts of dying or what it would be like to be dead? Does the patient have a plan? How specific is that plan? Are the means that the patient is considering easily accessible? Is the method likely to be lethal? Has the patient taken any steps to prepare to kill him or herself, such as gathering materials or rehearsing the attempt? At this point, you should consider whether or not you can provide the level of care required in this case. If the patient is imminently suicidal and has access to lethal means, a referral and transport to an emergency department is warranted. Keep in mind that emergency department visits and hospitalizations, while appropriate to stabilize a person who is imminently suicidal, are not good long-term strategies for suicide prevention. Of course, emergency department transports or hospitalizations will not be the case in most instances. Instead, you will be making a decision with regard to working with a patient or, in the case that you do not believe that you have the experience, 
training, or ability to work with a suicidal patient, referring him or her to another professional or facility. Let's assume that you will be treating the patient and talk about further assessment and other steps you should take with patients who are suicidal. Further assessment of patients presenting with suicidal ideation and behaviors can take many forms, and there are structured inquiries such as the methods described by Rudd, Joyner, and Rajab in Treating Suicidal Behavior, Job's Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality, and Shea's Chronological Assessment of Suicidal Events. For the purpose of this training, let's cover some of the common inquiries that you should make of patients who are suicidal. You should obtain information regarding the following. Hopelessness, a sense that there is nothing that can be done to decrease suffering or to make life more tolerable, is the symptom of depression most closely associated with suicide. Since past behavior predicts future behavior, you should obtain information with regard to the context and lethality of the most recent and all other attempts. Keep in mind that in 80% of completed suicides, the person has made at least one previous attempt. It is important to assess current and past ideation, focusing on the content of the ideation and the frequency, intensity, and duration of the thoughts of committing suicide. Beyond ideation, you must consider whether or not the person intends to attempt suicide. This is a point at which you would consider the patient's plan and associated features of that plan, including accessibility and lethality of means. It is important to assess a patient's levels of psychological pain, stress, agitation, and anger. These are typically assessed over the course of an initial interview, but should be considered in the context of any other warning signs of suicide. Current diagnoses and a history of psychiatric disorders are important factors to consider. As many as 15% of individuals with depression complete suicide, and 90% of persons who die from suicide meet criteria for one or more psychiatric disorders. It is important to consider the patient's social environment, as thwarted attempts at belongingness, social isolation, and recent loss are all significant risk factors, especially if the patient has lost his or her mother within the last three years, or his or her father within the last five years. Recent unemployment should also be considered in the assessment. Those who are not married and who do not have children are also at higher risk. Health problems, especially those that are chronic or those that involve pain, are significant risk factors for suicidal behavior. In the course of any clinical interview, it is important to assess the patient's current and historical use and abuse of substances. Alcohol intoxication is indicated in 64% of attempts, and one in five people who completed suicide showed evidence of opiates in their systems at the time of death, including heroin and prescription painkillers. You should consider certain historical factors, including a history of abuse, of family violence, or of suicide in the family. Especially when dealing with adolescent patients, you want to consider recent suicides in the geographical area or in the patient's age group as a risk factor. This is called suicide contagion. When asking about suicide, you want to discuss with the patient his or her reasons for wanting to die and the strength of his or her desire to die. Certain other demographic characteristics are important to consider. Suicide risk tends to increase over the adult life cycle with a peak between 55 and 65 although those between 15 and 24 are also at increased risk. Women attempt suicide three times more than men. However, men are four times more likely to complete suicide due to the fact that they use more lethal means. Caucasians have one of the highest levels of suicide, but Native Americans have a rate higher than any other ethnic group. Finally, rates are higher among those who practice Protestant religions than those who practice Judaism or Catholicism. In addition to these risk factors, you want to consider certain protective factors in your suicide assessment. Protective factors include good coping mechanisms, engaging in treatment and forming a strong alliance with a treatment provider, maintaining a strong connection to a religious or faith-based organization, having a good social support network, expressing and maintaining an orientation toward the future, active help-seeking behavior, an express desire to live, and the ability of the patient to express reasons for staying alive. 
In order to obtain the most complete information possible, considering that these themes are likely to be very difficult for the patient to discuss, you want to adopt a style of inquiry that is comfortable for you and that is direct, specific, and collaborative. On the basis of your assessment, you will decide to do one of three things. Have the patient transported immediately to an emergency department for evaluation, refer the patient to another professional, or treat the patient. If you decide to treat the patient, you should take certain steps immediately. First, consider seeing the patient with greater frequency for the first few sessions. This demonstrates to the patient that his or her health and safety are important to you, and it increases his or her engagement in the therapeutic process. This step has been shown to decrease suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. Second, you want to construct a safety plan. This is not a no-suicide contract, but a specific set of steps that a patient will take when confronted by suicidal thoughts. Typically, these include engaging in enjoyable or relaxing activities, reaching out to supportive significant others, and instructions to call 911 if the suicidal thought becomes overwhelming. More information on safety plans is available in the works cited above and from the resources I will tell you about at the end of this video. Finally, Suicide will become the focus of clinical attention until suicidal thoughts and behaviors have been adequately addressed. This requires frequent reassessment of the factors described above. This presentation is merely an introduction to the assessment and treatment of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in your patients. Anyone who is involved directly in the treatment of mental illness should consider more extensive training in the treatment of suicide as it is likely that you will be faced with a suicidal patient at least one time in your career. Further information on suicide and resources for referrals can be found in several places, including the NISPA website at nyspa.org, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America at adaa.org, the American Association of Suicidology at suicidology.org, and the New York State Office of Mental Health at omh.ny.gov. Finally, immediate help for anyone in suicidal crisis or who knows anyone who may be at risk for suicide is available from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. Thank you for your time.